Hello, I'm Dr. Muscle, and welcome to the part two video on lecture 16, Ethical Egoism. In the part one video, we discussed who Ayn Rand is. We talked about some of the similarities between her philosophy and, you know, Thomas Hobbes and what we discussed regarding Hobbes' philosophy. We discussed some similarities between her and Nietzsche, and we'll uh, mention some other similarities between the two in this video as well. And then we'll discuss the clear similarities between her and Aristotle, which shine right through uh, in her philosophy. And then we also tried to carve out then what ethical egoism is, right? That's what her moral theory is known as. We talked about egoism in general and then specifically what ethical egoism is. And we discussed how then that is really at the crux of, you know, the issue she has then with all prior traditional moral theories, right? And that's namely that they are self-sacrificing. You know, that they're implicitly at odds then with her ethical egoism. And so in this part, right, part two video, what we're going to do then is we're going to turn our attention to the opposite, right? Juxtapose everything else we've been saying in that first part video then with what she thinks is actually the proper or true view of morality. We'll flesh out what that proper view of morality looks like according to, to Rand. And then we'll go back and revisit these traditional prior moral theories and we'll spell out what she thinks is so problematic about them talk about some of the negative consequences and then we'll uh, offer a brief summary of everything we've talked about in both videos so that's the game plan here we'll go ahead and dive then back into the, the material itself or the lecture itself so we want to pick up what is a slide 11 uh, in the lecture and talk about what rant suggests is the true or proper view of morality however you want to put this point the idea being uh, look, she's not a moral skeptic. Okay? There is such a thing as morality. It's just that what that amounts to, doing the right thing, is not what you were growing up, what you grew up being told was the right thing. And instead, it's something completely different. All right? So remember, we were grow, grew up uh, learning all these traditional moral theories, which suggest, as we've mentioned in the first part video, right, that, that suggest that morality, doing the right thing, was at, was at odds, hence this verses here. Was, was at odds with what was in fact natural, practical, and rational for us. And that's the sense then in which she suggests in upholding these traditional moral standards, traditional moral views, uh, we are then acting, right, at, on the standard of death, okay? That was the traditional moral view because, again, it suggested that morality was implicitly at odds. But what she wants to do, I know, there is such a thing as morality, and there is such a thing as doing the right thing, and that's one reason why she and Nietzsche are not exactly similar. Okay? Um, she is a, not a moral skeptic. There is such a thing as morality, whereas Nietzsche is going to be a moral skeptic. Okay? There is such a thing as morality, but it's not at odds with acting on the standard of life, doing what's natural, practical, and rational for us. Okay? It's not at odds. Rather, it amounts to doing exactly that. So what is the right thing to do? Act on the standard of life. Do what's natural, practical, and rational. Do what you naturally want to do anyway, which is do whatever promotes your own flourishing and survival. Okay. So hopefully that's starting to become a little clear now. Okay, so there is such a thing as morality for Ian. It looks nothing like these, you know, utilitarianism, deontology, these traditional moral theories. And instead, it's the opposite, really. Right? And it implores us. Don't view these as being at odds, but rather being one and the same. So accordingly, this is again slide 11, quote, There is a morality of reason, a morality proper to man, and man's life is its standard of value. In turn, quote, All that which is proper to the life of a rational being is the good. All that which destroys it is the evil, end quote. And again, that's reminiscent of Aristotle and Aquinas in some respects, I'd say. Quote, If existence on earth is your goal, you must choose your actions and values by the standard of that which is proper to man for the purpose of preserving, fulfilling, and enjoying the irreplaceable value which is your life. Further, man, every man, is an end in himself. He exists for his own sake, and the achievement of his own happiness is his highest moral purpose. End quote. Again, these, all these quotes are indicative of, of the proper or true sense of morality or view of morality, according to Rand. Okay? So this is her carving out what morality really looks like, contrary to the traditional sacrificial uh, you know, moral theories. Uh, and by the way, that, that quote I just mentioned, that's kind of an underhanded slide at Kant, because remember, for Kant, 
Uh, he was one that had an issue with the utilitarians in the sense that, you know, they would be cold and calculating. They didn't treat us, you know, they didn't respect people as, you know, important in and of themselves. They didn't treat people like ends in themselves. So Kant always implored us, if we're going to be rational, moral beings, we have to treat everyone as ends in themselves. And so Rand's taking that same verbiage and saying, yeah, we are ends in ourselves, in ourselves and that's why we matter. Kant, and why you shouldn't be telling us then that the proper thing to do is not cater to our own inclinations. Remember, so, so Kant, and more on this in the next slide, is one whom you know she would hold up as being a great example of these traditional sac self-sacrificing moral theories, because he tells us right the proper thing to do is to set aside uh, you know what it is we want, our own inclinations, and instead we need a more pure motive. Remember for Kant, and that is. Uh, absurd for for Rand. Right? That's not natural. That's not rational, contrary to what um, Kant thought. Rand would argue it's not not rational and it's not practical. Um, so I think it's interesting how she uses Kant's own sort of terms, you know, to then kind of uh, poke fun at him or, or show us an issue within them. In sum, quote: The purpose of morality is to teach you, right? The proper purpose of morality is to teach you not to suffer and die, as is the case with all these traditional moral theories that puts morality at odds with what will help us survive and flourish and what's natural and so on. The purpose of morality is to teach you not to suffer and die, as all those traditional moral theories suggest, but to enjoy yourself and live, okay? to act on the standard of life, end quote. Okay, turning to slide 12. So in general, she's clearly, much like Nietzsche, not shy with respect to her criticisms of these prior traditional moral theories, including both deontology and consequentialism. Okay. Now, I know the editors um, suggest in that little snippet I had you read for egoism, that egoism is a version of consequentialism. Um, and there might be something to that. But, you know, she, insofar as, you know, say the utilitarians are the champions of consequentialism, generally speaking, she would certainly um, suggest there are problems with consequentialism. Okay. So she is not shy about her criticisms of, again, both the major theories that we, the two first major theories we talked about, uh, utilitarianism and deontology. Now, again, Aristotle and his virtue ethics, um, that might get the exception, uh, be an exception for Rand. Of all these prior moral theories, she does have some uh, respect for Aristotle, clearly. And in fact, as I mentioned in the part one video, if you go to and watch, which I think you should, that video where she's interviewed, she says that Aristotle is in fact the sole uh, influence, philosophical influence that she had. So aside from Aristotle and virtue ethics, right, all these traditional moral theories she clearly has an issue with, especially you know deontology and utilitarianism, both of those major ones, right? She thinks ask you to be irrational, insofar as they're telling you morality amounts to not doing what's what you want to do, what, and hence what's natural and practical and rational for you. Um, to ignore what's in your own interest, right? That's not rational, she wants to say. That's being irrational. Uh, hence, sacrificing your own value and catering then to others. So Kant, for example, what is doing the right thing for Kant? Completely ignoring and setting aside all your own personal inclinations. Remember, the more you let those seep in and factor into why it is you're doing what you're doing, the less morally praiseworthy you are. So that's a perfect example. Kant and deontology, um, you know, she would hold that up as, again, an example of some, someone who's requiring us to act on the standard of death, to turn our attention away from our own life and what matters to us. And as to the utilitarians, they ask you to, quote, sacrifice your intellectual integrity, your logic, your reason, your standard of truth in favor of becoming a prostitute whose standard is the greatest good for the greatest number, end quote. I remember Socrates, we had that discussion of Socrates, what was that, the end of uh, lecture 15, right? So uh, we had that discussion of how he has that unique nature in so far as he seems to do what so few human beings do, right? He holds up what he believes until the hour of his death, so to speak, and he admits that he's constantly neglecting his own interests and focusing on others, um, which makes him unusual, he admits. Um, and in fact, he remember how he suggests that the citizens of Athens are only screwing themselves over and um, killing him, right? They're hurting them more than they're hurting him because he was constantly catering to them and what they needed, 
right? And ensuring that those in positions of power were doing what they ought to be doing and um, facilitating the interests of those governed and so on. Well, and, he, you know, you get that uh, suggestion or this characterization of that mentality on the part of Socrates as if there's something divine about it, right, or respectable about it. And that's precisely the sort of mentality that Rand wants to say is deplorable, right, um, and problematic. That's what you will turn into if you truly uphold these traditional moral theories. Well, then you probably would act, start acting like Socrates and be so self-sacrificing. But that's not good, Rand wants to say. So kudos to Socrates because he's actually seems to be upholding this traditional sort of mentality, whereas a lot of us probably are screwing it up. He really is constantly catering to others and being self-sacrificing. But Rand wants, the whole point is Rand wants to say that's not a good thing. That's unhealthy. Nietzsche will say, you know, that's sickly. That's not, that's indicative of a weak, unhealthy spirit, Nietzsche would say, right? Or person, however you want to put that. Okay, so... Um, again, while many uphold this view of Socrates and, and suggest there's something admirable about this feature of his character, this notion that he's constantly neglecting his own interest for the sake of others, Rand would say that's the sort of the upshot, right? What actually happens when you uphold these traditional moral theories, and that's terrible. You know, Socrates was not good insofar as he constantly neglected his own interests. Look what happens. He dies, right? Is that why view that as a good thing? She would say, just like Nietzsche, that that's unhealthy. Again, it leads to death. It's acting on the standard of death. In fact, look what he ends up doing to uphold that traditional sort of mentality. He ends up accepting death, acting on, she would say that's a perfect example then of him acting on the standard of death. Um, um, okay. And I like the way that this is put. So if you look at the bottom of slide 12, so given what Rand believes is our true sense of morality, what ought to be our true sense, true sense of morality, what the proper sense of morality is, under a morality of sacrifice or under the traditional moral views, right, the not proper sense of morality. So under a morality of sacrifice, this is a quote, the first value you sacrifice is morality in the proper sense, right, end quote. So again, quote, under a morality of sacrifice, the first value you sacrifice is morality. So under the traditional view of morality, the first thing you're going to sacrifice is morality properly understood. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn to slide 13, where we'll then pick up on some of the specific issues she has with upholding to the traditional moral theories. I mean, and we just mentioned one, right? Look, what's going to end up happening? You're going to accept death as if that's a kind of favorable thing, right? As if that's ever a good thing, right? Accepting death. She's going to be on board with Nietzsche and thinking, no, anyone who, who talks about, for example, Socrates, that whole adage or that mentality that it's better to die nobly than to live in nobly. Rand would probably question that, you know, anybody who's willing to accept death at any, you know, at any cost or however they should put that. Right? There seems to be something fundamentally wrong with that kind of mentality. And again, Nietzsche would serve the same sort of position. But, all right. So turning to 13. You know, what are some of these specific issues then that stem from upholding and carrying out these traditional moral theories? Well, we alluded to some of these in the first part video, but we're going to sort of expand on them here. So, you know, first of all, okay, and this is what I'm mentioning at the top of the slide 13, okay. Remember, they're going to, so the traditional moral theories, right, they have the verses here, okay. So, what we ought to do is at odds, right, with what we naturally want to do, right, and what's truly practical and rational for us, right, that, that are at odds. Well, insofar as we can't help, right, it's natural to want to do what you want and want to survive and flourish and so on. You, it's natural, right? You can't help but have these kinds of thoughts and wants and so on. So it's going to happen, she says. And then you're told constantly by these traditional moral reviews that that's wrong. That you shouldn't have these kinds of thoughts where you're constantly, you know, thinking about what you want. So it's going to happen because it's natural, and at the same time, you're told that it's bad. Well, what's going to happen? Guilt. You're going to feel guilty, right? If you really do buy into these kinds of traditional moral theories, she's going to say guilt's going to be inevitable then, because you can't help but have these selfish sort of thoughts and wants, and then you're told that those are the wrong things to have, right? So what's going to result? Guilt. And then because you again can't help but have have these kinds of thoughts and then you keep screwing up and you have this tremendous sense of sort of guilt that builds up 
well, then you're going to think less of yourself as well, right? You're going to have a lowered self-esteem because you keep inevitably screwing up. Okay, think I'm such a bad person, right? Why is it that I can't stop constantly thinking about what it is I want, right? Why can't I con Why can't I continually think about the family and what's good for the city and so on? Well, because Rand wants to say because that's not natural. It's not natural to constantly do that, right? Rather, what's natural is to to want to be happy yourself, to think about what it is you want in particular. And what will help you survive? It's not natural to constantly be thinking about all these other, um, you know, entities or these other people. And granted, you might care, right? And you might want, you know, certain ones to flourish and survive, right? But it's not natural for you to constantly have to cater to everyone else, especially those that you have no vested interest in. Right? So again, these are going to, insofar as it's natural for you to focus, want to focus on yourself, right? These two things are going to be the inevitable upshot of these traditional moral theories insofar as they're still flourishing, right? Well, then you're going to have people that are constantly suffering from these. Right? So not good. Quote, since childhood, you have been hiding the guilty secret that you feel no desire to be moral in this traditional sense. No desire to seek self-immolation, that you dread and hate your code. End quote. So one of the big issues she has with these traditional moral theories is that they tend to be, right, they're rooted in need. They're need-based. So the idea is, you know, when it comes to doing the right thing, focus, you know, consider others and what do others need and then fill that void, fill that need for them. Well, that's a vicious cycle, according to Rand, because what ends up happening then is in devoting all your resources and time and investing you know, all these resources into catering to others. Well, then you develop your own needs as a result and then others have to constantly cater to you. Right, to fill your, the void that you now have because you were focused on them. And so there's this uh, inevitable vicious cycle. And in fact, she would say, if what you really care, we're be, we would be, be better off, we'd be in a better position to help others, if that's what you really care about. If we first focused on ourselves and put ourselves in the best, you know, made ourselves happy and ensured we were flourishing and going to survive, we would then be in a better position to help others in a meaningful way less hurtful way, right, in a way that wouldn't automatically open us up to them needing all kinds of help ourselves, right? So she, she wants to say, make that point too, that uh, again, in a way, if what you really care about is helping others, you'd still be better off letting people focus on themselves first and foremost, because then they'll actually be in a position to better offer help. But regardless, right, there's this, the main issue with uh, the, these other um, traditional moral theories Right. Um, not only are they self-sacrificing, but then they're constantly focusing on right, the needs and what everybody needs. Well, then again, that's going to then open us up to this constant vicious cycle where we then are become become needful ourselves and, and so on and so forth. So that's what she's getting at when she says, quote, when need is the standard, every man is both victim and parasite. As a victim, he must labor to fill the needs of others leaving himself in the position of a parasite, right, after you've devoted all your, your uh, resources to helping them, well, then you become a parasite whose needs must be filled by others, right, because then you become needful in some respect yourself. Right? So with, with such a foundation in need, if you think about this, right, if you're, if you're upholding these, in a con these traditional moral theories in a consistent fashion, you should feel guilty almost all the time, right? And you, I mean, you should suffer low self-esteem all the time because especially most of us, you know, watching this video, you know, we're, we're living life pretty good. Granted, some of us better than others, right? But most of us have things, all things considered pretty, pretty good. And so, you know, we're nevertheless, we're eating scoops of ice cream, right? And Rand's going to point out, if you truly up, uphold these traditional moral theories where you should be catering to who needs things, Right? What are you doing eating, having any luxuries? You know, you should be, if you have the money, the resources to be buying ice cream, you should be instead catering to those who can't even, you know, fulfill the basic needs of staying alive. Okay, so she wants, to, maybe this isn't quite as clear as you know, I can make it. So the point is, if you are consistent in upholding these traditional moral theories, then these become even more pronounced because every moment of your life, in so far as you're doing relatively okay, you could be doing something to help others that are in much more need than you are, right? And you're not, presumably, right? You're still watching this video, okay? And you could be off 
um, you know, working towards the needs of these others, which tr presumably these traditional moral theories are suggesting you ought to be doing. Right? So in some sense, she's like, insofar as we're not actually feeling a ton of guilt or lowered self-esteem, then we're not very consistent in upholding the traditional moral theories, right, that we suggest we believe in, would be the implication, it seems like. Okay, she says, quote, by the moral standard you've accepted, insofar as you are a utilitarian or a deontologist, whatever, uh, by the moral standard you've accepted, you are guilty every moment of your life. There is no mouthful of food you swallow that is not needed by someone somewhere on earth, end quote, at least more so than you. So what are you doing eating the dessert? What are you doing watching this video instead of going and doing something to thwart hunger or disease or something like that? And here you are, nonetheless, eating your bowl of ice cream, watching this video. Okay. Uh, if you are consistent in hope, upholding this traditional moral theory, then like Socrates, you, I mean, eventually, I mean, you're probably going to die as a result of upholding these if you're consistent. At the very least, you should be feeling tremendous amounts of guilt and lowered self-esteem. Um, okay, so that was slide 14. Another issue, and this is a very Nietzschean point, uh, and I should mention, so uh, I meant to look up her dates, and I forgot to. I want, So Nietzsche was born in 1844, died in 1900, and I'm guessing Rand was born right around that time of his death. Uh, she's giving interviews, and she looks fairly young still, late 50s, and then giving interviews uh, in you know the early 80s still. You know, she's looking a lot older at that point. The whole point is, though, so she comes on the scene shortly after Nietzsche, and again, it would, I have to think that she, you know, that she did read, at the very least, read Nietzsche. Now, she, as I mentioned several times at this point, she says her sole influence is Aristotle. Um, but the way she makes some of these points is just so, again, reminiscent of Nietzsche, who, again, the whole point with the dates was he came on the scene then right before, he died right, I want to say, right as Rand was in, you know, that she was born, more or less. And then, again, I would have to guess she died in the early 80s. I'm not 100% sure on that, but very Nietzschean point here with respect to what she has to say regarding love and more generally um, how these traditional moral theories in, in religion as well, traditional religion and so on, how they suggest, um, you know, we ought to think of love, but then also judgment in general and, and judging others and, and so on. Um, so again, a very Nietzschean point. So think so she finds these problematic, these sorts of views, insofar as they, there's this suggestion that everyone is equal, right, within these kinds of traditional moral and religious views. Everyone is equally worthy of our respect, our consideration, right? Everyone has to enter the calculation, however you want to put the point. Okay, so these sacrificial moral theories, these religions, they demand, quote, that you surrender your soul to promiscuous love for all comers. And there's a sense of equality. Everybody's equally worthy of consideration, respect, etc. Allah Nietzsche, Rand would say, no, that's not natural. We naturally make our natural judgments, right? We parse through these things. We don't treat everyone as equal, right? We treat them as we think they are naturally we want to, right? Treat them as if we think they are deserving. Certain ones who we admire as Rand would say, because they uphold certain virtues, a la uh, Aristotle. Well then, right, we, if left to our own natural devices, well then we tend to cherish them and respect them and love them or however you want to put them, put that, right? J judge them worthy in some respect. And whereas naturally, right, if left to our own natural devices, we're gonna condemn, criticize the alternative. Okay, one that's living, living a vicious life, not upholding the virtues or some, some manner of speaking that way, right? The point being, not everyone is equally worthy of our love and respect. But these traditional moral theories talk as if they are, right? The utilitarians, everyone counts equally. Okay? The deontologists, we got to not lie to everyone, right? Everyone is the same in some sense. Um, love thy neighbor, even think love thy enemy. Again, that's the sort of mentality that is facilitated by these traditional moral theories and religious um, doctrines and so on. And she wants to say, again, that's not natural. Um, we naturally, you know, view people as not equal, right? We naturally love and despise certain people, again, based on, you know, their merits and how we judge them. But so the idea is the traditional moral theories, though, they want to um, 
sort of uh, demean or uh, sort of offset this natural tendency we otherwise would have and sort of obscure things, um, stunt our judgment. I don't know exactly how to put this point. Uh, but instead, right, they want to, they implore us to treat everyone the same, okay, to um, shun that natural tendency that we have to want to make these kinds of judgments and to distinguish some that we love and some that we hate. No, right? And instead, the, the ten, general current, uh, the t general tendency of these traditional moral theories is to instead treat everyone equally or the same, okay? And again, that's at odds with what we naturally would otherwise do, Rand and Nietzsche wants to say. And plus, it's problematic, she wants to say, because it demeans the worth of our love, if you think about it. Again, very Nietzschean point. If I say, I love you, 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 what does my love mean anymore? If I love everyone so indiscriminately, right, and I tell everyone I love them, does it mean anything? Um, so aren't you implicitly devaluing the very worth of love itself, um, you know, in your judgment, if you obscure things in this sort of fashion, she wants to say. And I don't want to get into it too much, but it also seems to be sort of what's at issue with her political stance, too. She, in that the video I provide a link to, you know, she's very much against the welfare um, state because, you know, um, you know, welfare sort of uh, government policies, because at the heart of them is this idea that everyone is equal and equally worthy of being taken care of and respect and consideration, however you want to put it. And again, that is completely at odds with what she fundamentally thinks is the case or ought to be the case. Okay. So she thinks you implicitly render your love meaningless, your judgment in some sense, in general sense, meaningless too, right? If it's obscured in such a fashion, you render it meaningless and insignificant by sort of dishing it out so indiscriminately right, without discretion. Okay, let's turn to 16 and kind of summarize slide 16 and summarize, you know, what we've said in both the parts one and part two videos. Um, so in some, basically the primary problem she has, as we've been mentioning, right, is this. Traditional moral theories are putting these at odds, right? The verses. So is the following lethal tenet. This is the problem she highlights. This is the primary problem. Quote, the belief that the moral... And the practical, and what does she mean by practical? Whatever, this is another quote, whatever you must practice to exist, whatever works, succeeds, achieves your purpose, whatever brings you food and joy, whatever profits you. So again, the more general quote, okay, the belief that the moral and the practical are opposites. That is the lethal fundamental tenet at issue and at play with respect to all these uh, traditional moral theories. And that's the problem she has. Okay? These are not, ought not to be at odds uh, rather, the true or proper, proper view of morality will realize, right, or will allow us to realize that doing the right thing amounts to acting on the standard of love, doing what you otherwise naturally want to do, pursue your own flourishing survival and interest. And in fact, then, remember the whole idea, if, if we care about others as well and what they need, well, then you will, if so, so long as you focus on your own survival, interest, flourishing, etc., then you'll actually be in a better position to help those others as well, should you want to. Okay. But there, you know, the traditional moral theories and pitting these against each other, that yields an unhealthy ultimatum, Rand suggests. Either be moral or live. Okay, well, that's that's going to create all sorts of problems. No, that does not have to be the choice, right? We can say these aren't at odds. We don't have to make a choice. Rather, we can view, right, doing the right thing as acting on the standard of life, just living, right? And doing whatever you, you otherwise would do to try to live a happy and flourishing life. So for Rand, okay, to be moral in a rational sense, just is to value one's own life, okay, and to seek happiness accordingly, to try to survive and flourish, as you otherwise naturally would do, you know, if you hadn't convinced yourself otherwise, a la that rational and reflective capacity, via these traditional moral theories, if you hadn't been deluded by them, you would have done all this anyway, right? So remember, you are an end in yourself, Kant. Okay? You exist for your own sake. So you should be leery, the upshot of all this, right? You should be leery of any demand for your help, right? So we have an obligation, Kant says, to help others in need, right? That, that's kind of a demand, right? For our time and resources. No. She says no, all right? They, nobody has the right to demand any 
of your time and resources, or they shouldn't anyway. Uh, and you should find that very problematic. It should be throwing up red flags whenever you get this sort of intimation on the part of others that you owe them anything, right? So any sort of demand or the suggestion you owe them anything, right? That should be problematic, she wants to say. Right? Quote, to demand it is to claim that your life is his property. Remember, you're, you're an end in yourself. Uh, you're you're valuable in yourself and to suggest that you owe someone else something in this moral sense it's not treating you fully as an end in yourself right rather it's treating you as some somehow a means to something to help fulfill something for them uh, and i thought it was interesting uh the i think his name is mike wallace the interviewer in the video i provide a link to at the end he kind of alludes to this problem you know helping others you know so we just can't help others you know something along those lines and and Rand, you know, the idea is, so is, is helping and loving others, is that always problematic, Rand? Well, no, it doesn't have to be, she wants to say, right? So again, it's in how you look at it. Do you view helping others as like something that's obligatory, morally obligatory? I have to do it. It's a moral obligation. That's problematic. That's what she finds flawed, okay? But if it's something you want to do, there's nothing wrong then with helping others, okay? And so that's what she's getting at when she says things like, quote, to demand you, or sorry, do you ask if it's ever proper to help another man, to love them, to help them? No, if he claims it as his right or as a moral duty that you owe him. Yes, if such is your own desire based on your own selfish pleasure and the value of his person and his struggle. So helping others, loving others, that's not automatically wrong from Rand's perspective. Right? If you want to do it, that's fine. And in fact, it might be in your interest to help others as much as possible because then they might be more likely to reciprocate it. Okay? The problem is in how you view that helping others. Do you view it as something you have to do from a moral perspective? You know, because you're a Kantian deontologist or utilitarian? That is, uh, that's what's problematic. Okay? Not the love itself or helping others. That itself isn't problematic. It's the feeling like you have to do it. That it's a moral, morally obligatory. That is where she roots the issue, not in the love or helping others itself. Okay, I think that does it for us. Obviously, an interesting moral theory. It is a moral theory, right? Because she is saying there is a proper thing to do. But it is interesting because it's completely at odds, seemingly with every other moral theory, maybe the exception being Aristotle. Seems to be at odds with every other moral theory we've talked about. Okay. So, reflection time questions. What do you make of her interesting moral theory? Does morality really revolve around doing whatever is in your own interest? And I think she might be, you know, she could be right, but I think um, it's a difficult theory to wrestle with for a lot of us because maybe we're flawed. And it makes sense, right? She would say, well, it makes sense that you all associated morality with you know, X, Y, Z, because that's what you grew up with, right? But, I mean, we all, I think most of us, anyway, not all, most of us associate morality with, you know, not catering to what we want, but precisely with, like, sort of uh, factoring others in some shape or form, right? And so it is strange, then, to hear of a moral theory that tells us, actually, that's the wrong thing to do, right? And instead to focus on uh, what you want. Um, it's, it's kind of weird, uh, but again, she would probably say, well, it makes sense because that's all, that's what you grew up with, right? And that's what tradition tells you. Um, you know, you're just, you're used to what tradition has told you. And so of course it's going to sound weird then to hear me tell you that there is such a thing as morality and it's not doing what they said that suggested, but at the exact opposite. Anyway, so what are your thoughts on, um, her interesting moral theory? Um, and what about these uh, problems that she associates with the traditional moral theories. Do you agree with her? Do you think there are these substantial issues associated with upholding these traditional moral theories? Um, and do you agree with this significance she attaches to them? So maybe you, you agree, hey, yeah, there is some of this associated with them, but it's not as bad as she thinks. Or maybe you wholeheartedly agree, or maybe you don't agree at all. Hey, uh, I grew up, you know, basically utilitarian, or I grew up, you know, religious, and I, you know, I don't have any of these sorts of issues, um, as Rand suggests, I, I should or would. Um, so anyway, what do you think, what do you make of the suggestion that we have all these kinds of negative consequences associated with upholding traditional moral theories? All right, that's it. So I guess quick preview then of uh, what we have to look forward to 
really we only have two more lectures left. We have lecture 17 where we'll discuss, so the next one, moral relativism. And then the last lecture, moral skepticism. That's it. It's only two more lectures. I know it's going to be tough for some of you. Do the best you can to hold back the tears. I know you've come, you know, grown to love listening to all, you know, me ramble on and on about all these moral theories, but the end is near. Uh, so lecture 17, what's on tap? We have an interesting discussion of moral relativism. So you probably heard of relativism or maybe moral relativism. The idea, so we'll get we'll get both a pro, you know, we'll, get, we'll, we'll go through a case for moral relativism. So from Ruth Benedict, um, a famous cultural anthropologist. So basically the moral relativist is going to say, you know, what we associate with morality, doing the right thing, it hinges on our, our environment, our upbringing, our culture. And then we'll have the case against it provided by James Rachels, who wants to say, you know, there are at least critical elements of what we associate with morality that cannot hinge on, cannot be said to hinge on one's environment, one's culture. So hence, it's not relative. Okay. So the idea, basically, next lecture, we're going to be wrestling with the idea of moral relativism. Um, does morality depend on, or to what extent does morality, if at all, does morality depend on one's culture, one's environment, one's surroundings? So we'll get the the in favor case of Ruth Benedict. You know she is a moral relativist, and then we'll have James Rachel's a famous contemporary philosopher argue against moral relativism, offer a case against it. And interestingly, he'll say that one of the reasons he's motivated and so concerned uh, to address moral relativism is because he thinks it's the last sort of step to becoming a full blown moral skeptic, which then will be what will end uh, the whole course discussing and that's again moral skepticism with Nietzsche so that'll be lecture 18. So anyway that's two lectures from now we won't worry about moral skepticism yet. We'll read uh, moral relativism a bit on moral relativism for um, the next lecture though so stay tuned for that again moral relativism is what we'll discuss in lecture 17. Hopefully you enjoyed our our uh, discussion of lecture 16 and ethical egoism. We'll see you next time for lecture 17. Thanks.